Well, good evening. This Good Friday, we want to welcome you to our Good Friday service here at First Baptist Church. We pray your week has gone well, and we pray that you would find this service a blessing to your heart. Uh, let me just quickly uh, thank you for the giving that you have been faithful with and doing while we have not gathered here together. Uh, many of you have given online. Uh, several of you have mailed in your tithes, and others have simply dropped them by the office. And again, I cannot uh, overstate how important that is, and we just want to thank you so much for your cooperation. Uh, while we are not assembling together, we can still assemble in your living room or wherever uh, this video finds you at today. Let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Again, welcome to First Baptist Church. We miss you. We would much rather be doing this in person here, gathered together, but thank God for digital electronics that we are able to come into your home. Let's pray. Father, this is Good Friday. And Lord, we realize this is a significant day in the life of a Christian. This is the day the Lord Jesus Christ died for our sin. This is the day that he bore our transgressions and iniquities on the cross. This is the day that he was beaten and battered and literally murdered for our sin. This is the day, God, that he paid the penalty for our sin. And today, God, we just want to thank you so much for the love of God that sent the Son of God to die for the sins of this world. And today, Lord, as we gather together, wherever we may be, God, we pray that this uh, service would go to the furtherance of the gospel, that, God, those who do not know Jesus Christ as our Lord and personal Savior would know him today. And those that do know him would have uh, a new recall, God, of the price, the extreme price that you paid when you sent your son to die for our sin. And it's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. So it's Good Friday. As the pastor was just telling us, this is the day that we commemorate the suffering and the atonement that was made for us. We can go into Good Friday realizing that we have hope that it did not end in the grave. The first day, darkness conquered light. Second day, the stone was rolled in place, and he laid in the grave. And on the third day, he arose. So I want to give a shout out to my friend Mark um, for allowing me to use this song today. And uh, we have comfort knowing on the third day, he rose. <laughs>
church no genie I left the wrong one genie is going to come up and we're going to sing a very beautiful hymn that all just points to what happened on good friday there's a fountain filled with blood
the blame for the wrath we stand forgiven at the cross now the daylight flees now the ground beneath quakes as its maker bows his head curtain torn in two dead are raised to life finished the victory cry this the power of the cross Christ became the cross oh to see my name written in the wounds for through your suffering i am free death is crushed to death life is mine to live one through yourself Less love this the power of the cross son of god slain for us what a love what a cost we said forgiven now the what a beautiful song there by Eve. It is hard to believe if you know Eve. She is 18 years old now. Turned 18 this past Wednesday. And it's amazing that uh, these kids are growing up so fast. And it's such a blessing when young people began to follow the Lord at such a young age. And I remember when she got saved, uh, in fact, all the kids of her family have given their life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And what a blessing that is. I want to thank Mike and Jeannie also for ministering there in song. I want to invite you this evening to take your Bibles and find with me two books. The book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 53. We will read one verse in Isaiah chapter 52. And then I want you to hold your place there and find the book of Matthew in chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. I'll give you just a second to find that verse and those books. Isaiah chapter 52 to begin with in verse 14. And then we'll read chapter 53. And then we'll be going to the book of Matthew. In times of trouble, everyone clings to something. And I don't know what it is that you're clinging to today for your faith and your hope, but I pray it's the Lord Jesus Christ because any other thing that you may lay hold of will fail you in the days of difficulty that we're transgressing or plowing through today. It's very difficult and we feel like we are plowing through them. It's untilled ground. Uh, we've never been here before. But God is going to see us through this difficult time and we're looking for the end of this where we can come back together and assemble here in the house of God very soon, we pray. Well, if you are a Christian, Today is uh, a highlight uh, in our lives. Just the day the Lord Jesus Christ laid down his life for our sin. And as we end this day, we end this day with the Lord Jesus Christ being dead. 
He is no longer on the cross before the end of this day. He will be removed. His lifeless body will be taken down and he will be laid in a borrowed tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. Well, as we begin reading here, Isaiah paints a picture, so to speak, of the sufferings of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so let me begin reading here in Isaiah chapter 52. And in verse 14, the Bible says, And many were astonished at thee. His visage, that is, his appearance, was so marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. Talking about the, the terrible beating that he had taken for our sin, uh, he was beaten beyond recognition practically. And then beginning here in verse 1 of chapter 53, Isaiah would write, Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? And in speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. There was nothing to be attracted to. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord have laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked, and with the rich men in his death, and with the rich in his death. Talking about the borrowed tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He had put on him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. That is, he will see all those who will eventually in our generation and those to follow who will place their faith and trust in him for the forgiveness of sin. It was that the Lord Jesus Christ could see as he suffered and died for us. He shall prolong his days, meaning that even though he died there on that Good Friday, that was not the end of his life. He would rise again. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied by his knowledge. Shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil, the plunder, with the strong. Because he had poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bared the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. When you go to the book of Matthew, and in Matthew chapter 27, Matthew literally pens that day when Jesus was nailed to that tree. Here in Matthew chapter 27, Beginning here in verse 22, the Bible begins here with Pilate. The Jews have been screaming, crucify him. Pilate had in prison there a man named Jesus and a man named Barabbas. And here it was a custom for him to release one and literally punish the other. 
Well, Barabbas was a well-known criminal. Jesus was an enemy, or rather an innocent man, yet he was an enemy of the Jews because they rejected him. He was not the coming king and the Messiah that they had looked for. But yet notice here in Matthew chapter 27, beginning in verse 22, Pilate said unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? They all said unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why? What evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could not prevail anything, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and he washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. So Pilate literally, figuratively and literally, uh, washing his hands with water, thinking that he's washing his hands free of the blood of the Lord Jesus. And he said, you know what? His blood be upon your hands. And notice what they literally say. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us. Literally, they did not know what they were saying. Not only on us, but on our children. Then released he Barabbas unto them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered unto him the whole band of soldiers, and they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit upon him, and they took their reed from his hand, literally, and they smote him, on the head, literally on the crown of thorns that was on his head. And after they had mocked him, they took the robe off of him, put on his clothing, his raiment again, and led him away to be crucified. As you can imagine, being so weak from the scourging, from the beating, they had to find someone to help him bear his cross to Calvary. The Bible said, and as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they were come unto the place called Golgotha, some people pronounce that Golgotha, literally Golgotha, that is to say a place of a skull. They gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall, and when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him, parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And the Bible would continue to say there in verse 36, And sitting down, they watched him there, and set over his head his accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then were there two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand and another on the left. And they that passed by, those that passed by, notice, reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross and listen, likewise also the chief priests mocking him with the scribes and elders said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. Listen to this. In verse 43 they said, He trusted in God, let him deliver him now if he will have him. In other words, let God, who Jesus claimed to be the Son of, deliver His own Son, even if God would have Him. For He said, I am the Son of God. The thieves also, which were crucified with Him, cast the same in His teeth. Now from the sixth hour there were darkness all over the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama shabbatani. That is to say, my God, my God, 
Why hast thou forsaken me? Why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there when they heard that said, This man calleth for Elijah. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. The rest said, Let be, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks split. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Now notice in verse 54, Now when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done, talking about the resurrection of some of the Old Testament saints, they feared greatly, saying, Truly this was the Son of God. May the Lord add His blessings upon the reading of His Word. I want to invite you to go back with me to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 53 is where we're going to find our moment here of time together. And then we will go immediately back to the book of Matthew. Between these two books, we see a picture painted in vivid proportion of the suffering of the Lord Jesus. In 2004, Mel Gibson produced The Passion of Christ. If you watched that movie back in 2004, you know that it not only described the events of the last 12 hours of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, but literally, it was a gruesome movie. It portrayed quite vividly the beating of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you got to imagine, and sometimes you got to wonder, even if how gruesome that was, if it did justice to the punishment and the pain that He bore for our sin. Just a few days earlier, people went before Him as He entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. There shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is He that cometh in the name of the Lord. The shouting of the people that day was only matched by the people's animosity on this day. When they yelled out, crucify him. And then they would repeat that. Crucify him. Let his blood be upon our hands. Let his blood be upon us. And listen, not only that, but upon our children. As you read the account of the crucifixion, you can't help but to notice the rage of the people as Jesus was nailed to the cross. And then when He takes His last breath, you notice the extreme silence of the people as they turn and they leave His lifeless body hanging on that tree. He died in our place for our sin. You know, the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible would then tell us about the penalty of sin. In Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. In times of difficulty, everybody clings to something. What is it that you're clinging to today? On what became known as Good Friday, Jesus paid sin's penalty for us and He broke sin's power over us. And between the books of Matthew and Isaiah, we see a vivid picture of the high cost of our redemption. Pastors are notorious in extending the altar call to salvation. Listen, the free gift of God. Listen very carefully. It's not free. It cost an extreme price. It cost the life of the Son of God. And for you to receive that, while many believe it may be free to you, literally, it's not free in that it requires an exchange of life. In that, Christ died for me that I might live for Him. 
And so when I repent of my sin and I receive that gift of God, literally, I am coming out on the winning end in that I'm getting the Lord Jesus Christ and God is getting me. It's an exchange. One that God longs to take place. And as we begin looking at this this evening, I want you to notice here in Isaiah chapter 53, first of all, we see a portrait concerning the pain he will suffer. A portrait concerning the pain that he will suffer. And I'm not going to read all of these verses again, but here in Isaiah chapter 53, the Bible says in verse 3, he's despised and he's rejected of men. He's a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. If you believe in highlighting or underlining in your Bibles, I would underline that phrase. The Lord Jesus literally was well acquainted with grief. And as Isaiah here tells us of the mystery, or rather the misery that Jesus will endure in paying the penalty for our sin, he will suffer brutally from the hands of at least three people. He would first of all suffer from the hands of the Roman soldiers. He would suffer from the hands of the Roman soldiers. Notice the four words in verse 3 of the book of Isaiah. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. We hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Again, if you like underlining and highlighting, underline those four words there. He was despised, rejected, sorrows, and grief. Imagine the tremendous pain that Jesus experienced for your sin that you might not have to experience for your sin yourself. And as we begin to look at this, notice first of all, we see the pain of his mental abuse. We, we hear a lot about mental anguish today. We live in a world today where there's a lot of people suffering from depression, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and whatever other avenue there may be. But think about the mental anguish that the Lord Jesus Christ went through. What he went through, many of us would have crumbled under. In fact, there are many people today who are suffering mentally with depression in the same regards to the areas of life that Jesus suffered in while being beaten for our sin. When you go back to the book of Matthew, and go back with me there to the book of Matthew in chapter 27, I want you to see a little bit about this mental anguish. In Matthew chapter 27, notice here, first of all, as we understand this, we need to know, beginning in verse 27, that as the time of his crucifixion grew near, his grief grew greater. As the time of his crucifixion literally grew near or drew near, the anguish and the grief that he would experience grew greater. First of all, there in verse 28, we see that they stripped him of his clothing. They stripped him of his clothing. Notice, and they stripped him and they put on him a scarlet robe. They literally humiliated him in front of onlookers. Remember as those who passed by, the Bible said they wagged their heads and they said, listen, he saved others. Let him save himself. And so literally he was placed there on one of the main thoroughfares of people going in and out of Jerusalem and stripping him after the beating of literally verse 26 all could see the blood, the marks, the cuts, and even the rips of flesh that he had endured. And later, as I've already read, they would literally gamble. They would cast lots for his clothing. Notice there, verse 26, and after he had scourged Jesus, they literally beat him to death. And you'll hear a little bit more about that momentarily, but not only did they strip him of his clothing, but notice they also mockingly placed a scarlet robe upon him. In verse 28 again, 
and put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They did all of this in ridicule. They did all this in mocking. In verse 37, he proclaimed to be king of the Jews. They simply were saying, king? Well, then give the king a reed. He's king? Well, then give the king a crown. He's king? Well, then give the king a robe. And every king needs a crown. Therefore, they placed that on his head. And regarding the robe, the scarlet robe, I like what the Believer's Bible Commentary says. Listen. It says, but that robe being scarlet in color, keep that in mind. But that robe has a message for us. It has a message for you and it has a message for me. Since scarlet is associated with our sin. You see that in Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18. Though our sins be as scarlet, they shall be made white as snow. Though our sins be as scarlet, the blood of the Lord Jesus will wash them white as snow. And so the robe being scarlet, reminiscent of our sin. Here the Bible commentary says that since scarlet is associated with sin, I like to think that the robe pictures my sins being placed on Jesus so that God's robe of righteousness might be placed on me. Think about that. You'll see this verse a little bit later, but in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, for he, that's God, made him, that's Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. God literally, Amen, brother. listen, gave us a robe of righteousness. And they gave Jesus a robe symbolic of the color of our sin. But not only did they give him a scarlet robe, but the Bible also said they scorned him. In verse 29, they literally mocked him. They bowed their knee. Hail, King of the Jews. They literally bowed before this so-called self-proclaimed king, yet they never proclaimed him king. Hence was the problem. Their bowing the knee was an act of ridicule. Yet, according to Philippians chapter 2 and verse 10, the Bible says, At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That is not what they're doing there. But that's what they will do one day. In fact, the Bible would tell us you will either bow before him today in repentance and receive him as your Lord and personal Savior, or you will eventually one day bow in recognition. But having rejected the Lordship over your life, you will be cast into an eternal lake of fire. Eventually you will bow. The question is not, are you going to bow? The question is, when are you going to bow? Amen. Will it be today in repentance and ask Christ to be your Savior? Or will it be later when you are made to prior to being cast into the lake of fire? And so the Bible says they scorned him. But notice it even gets worse than that. Notice in verse 30 there, the Bible says they spit upon him they spit upon him and they spit upon him they took the reed and they smote him on the head think about it to this point to this point the disciples had forsaken him Peter had denied him Judas had betrayed him his own people had crucified him yes according to Isaiah Jesus was well acquainted with grief and all of that for your sake and mine. But not only do we see the pain of his mental abuse, what about the pain of his physical abuse? The pain of his physical abuse. In Isaiah chapter 53 again, and you know, if I had something to mark my spot here, I would, but I know you do. So give me a second. In Isaiah chapter 53, listen in verse, verse, uh, in verse 5. 
But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. With his stripes, listen very carefully. With his stripes we are spiritually healed. We are healed from our sin. Through the death and the burial and the resurrection of our Lord. So according to Isaiah... He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Now, listen, you're in Isaiah chapter 53, and I want you to notice this. Go to Isaiah chapter 50 just for a second. Isaiah chapter 50. I realize you're running out of fingers, but listen, you won't be here but for one verse. And I would encourage you to highlight this verse. And so as we look at this, I want you to literally think about this. They snatched the beard from his face. They snatched the beard from his face. Notice in Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 6 where it speaks of the Lord Jesus. I gave my back to the smiters, meaning when they went to scourge him. Remember we read that verse in Matthew chapter 27? When they scourged him, he gave them his back, right? Mm -hmm. Notice, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. They literally pulled the beard from his face. I hid not my face from shame and what? Spitting. We read of that in Matthew where they spat in his face. So here in Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 6 we see not only have they already humiliated them, him and all this mental, or mental abuse that he has suffered, what about the physical abuse? They started with literally snatching pulling, ripping, tearing the beard from his face. But it doesn't start there. It literally just begins. Not only that, but they scourged him. Listen, they, he gave his back to the smiters, according to Isaiah in chapter 50. Here in Matthew chapter 27 and verse 26, And when they had scourged Jesus, they delivered him to be beaten or rather to be crucified. Many, they beat him severely with what is called a cat of nine tails. And if you've seen that movie, The Passion of Christ, here you see the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 6 coming true, where I gave my back to the smiters. And then literally you see the cat of nine tails that would literally have metal and bone fragments woven into that. And as they wrap that around his back and they would yank that, it would literally tear and yank the flesh from his body, exposing tendons and muscles and even leaving vital organs exposed. Many in that day did not even make it to the cross. They died of the scourging. Isaiah chapter 52 and verse 14, we read that earlier, tells us that his visage, his appearance was so marred and disfigured that he was barely recognizable. This is the beating that he took for you. And this is the beating that he took for me. But not only that, here in verse 30, the Bible says they struck him. They struck him. Notice there in verse 30 of Matthew 27, and they spit upon him, and they took that reed, and they smote him on the head. Now, what was on his head when they smote him? A crown of thorns that they have woven together. You see that here in verse 29, where they plaited a, a crown of thorns together, and they put that on his head. And as they took that reed that they gave him, they took that and they smote him on top of the head, driving that crown of thorns into his head and into his brow and with blood streaming down his face. He became literally unrecognizable. The scripture gives us seven words that are terribly under described. Notice there, he delivered him to be crucified. Literally six words in the King James. He delivered him to be crucified. All of the above took place prior to them nailing him 
to the cross. And this literally would be a picture symbolic of the beating that He endured for you and me. And so He would suffer at the hands of the Roman soldiers, but He would also suffer at the hands of a sovereign God. Suffer at the hands of a sovereign God. Remember Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 4? Let's go back there just for a second. I'm using my watch if I could to mark my Bible. Uh, don't get excited about that. That's the only thing I'm using it for. But when we look at this, I want you to think about this. They never once saw themselves literally crucifying Him, but they saw God doing it. Notice in Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 4. Surely He hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem Him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. Let me just ask you something. On Good Friday 2,000 years ago, who crucified Jesus? Was it the Jews? Was it your sins or mine? The Bible would tell us it was literally God who crucified His Son. The Bible would tell us, I believe in, in the book of Revelation, that He was a lamb slain before the foundation of the world. And as we look at this, he would suffer from the hands or suffer at the hands of a sovereign God. And so as you look at this, first of all, he was a prepared sacrifice. He was a prepared sacrifice. You see that in verse 4 where he was smitten of God. Notice in verse 7 of Isaiah 53, that yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Notice in verse 10, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. How in the world could it please God to have his son beaten like this? I can only believe that it was because God the Father and God the Son had the ability to look past the cross and see in the future those who would become the children of God because of the suffering endured by the Son of God. You look at this. The life Christ lived, He lived for this moment. He did not come to live life on this earth. He came to this earth to die on a cross for my sin and for yours. And when you look here in verse 10 of Isaiah, the Bible says, He shall see His seed. Meaning, He will see all those who have placed their faith and trust in Him. Hebrews chapter 12 in verse 2, the Bible says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross. Who was the joy set before Jesus when He was nailed to that cross? I can only believe it was the seed. Those who would give their life to the Lord Jesus Christ through the sacrifice of the Son of God, sinners who rejected God could be adopted into the family of God. And when you look at this, not only do we see that He was a prepared sacrifice, but we also see the resting of sin upon Him. The resting of sin upon Him in Isaiah chapter 53 and in verse 5, the Bible says, The chastisement of our peace was upon Him. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him. And you see this in Isaiah. You also see it in Matthew chapter 27. And so just to turn there just for a second. Look in Matthew chapter 27 and look in verse 45. I want you to see, first of all, the sky turned black. In Matthew chapter 27, they have nailed him to a cross. 
And now notice in verse 45, now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. I believe there the sky turned black. Why? Because secondly, God turned his back on his son. I believe it was during this darkness that God hid his face from his son and he made his son, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, he made his son to become sin for us. And God turned away because he could not look at sin, even if it was the sin placed upon the back of his son. Second Corinthians 5.21 For He hath made Him, He, God, made Him, Christ, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, He was sinless, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. It was during this time that Jesus bore the indescribable curse for our sin. And this led one writer to say this, and those three hours were compressed the hell which we deserved, the wrath of God against all our transgressions. He would suffer at the hands of the Roman soldiers. He would suffer at the hands of a sovereign God. But then he would also suffer at the hand of blind sinners. Of blind sinners. Listen, and we've not read that verse yet, but here in Luke chapter 23, let me just share a verse with you. In Luke chapter 23, listen, they did not know what they were doing when they were crucifying the Lord of glory. In Luke 23 and verse 34, then said Jesus on the cross, remember the words that he cried out? Father, forgive them for what? For they know not what they do. They crucified him ignorantly. They knew not what they do. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and in verse 8, the Bible says, For if they would have known, whether it is the de demonic realm or those empowered by the demonic realm during that time, listen, for if they would have known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. When you go back to Matthew, they were blinded and they were hardened by sin. And men and women and boys and girls will be held accountable for their rejection of Jesus. Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15 that God had mercy on him because he persecuted the church in ignorance. We are not nearly half as ignorant as Paul was then. Because we have the whole Word of God and we can go back and we can look at the cross. And therefore, Romans chapter 1 can hold us accountable and say that men and women and boys and girls, we are without excuse. We're without excuse. And we will give an account of our acceptance or of our rejection of the Lord Jesus. So we see a portrait concerning the pain he will suffer and very quickly we see also the cruelty of the cross here in Matthew chapter 27. Notice the results of his beating is apparent. I mean remember they, there in verse 26 they scourged him and then he led him away to be crucified. The estimated weight of that cross is approximately 200 pounds. 200 pounds and it was common practice for criminals to bear their cross and carry it to the hill in which they would be crucified. But we know that Jesus was so weak that they had to get uh, Simon of Cyrene to help carry his cross because he was beaten beyond recognition. And he was beaten too weak to carry his own cross. And then here in Matthew chapter 27, listen, and they had nailed him here to the cross. And notice in verse 33, when they were coming to a place called Gogatha, that is to say, a place of the skull, they gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall. And when he had tasted thereof, he refused literally that drink. So we see his refusal of anesthetic. 
this is a fulfillment of Psalm 69 and verse 21. And it was simply a drugged wine used as an anesthetist to dull the pain. But Jesus refused to allow anything to mitigate his sufferings on our behalf. When they tried to give him that gall, he spit it out. There on that cross, he refused it. But then, not only that, notice the ridicule that he endured there. And we're not going to read that again, but in verses 35 through 44, people literally saying, if you be the Son of God, come down from that cross. Literally, hey, he's the Son of God. Let's see if God will save him. If God himself will have him. People walking by, wagging their heads, shouting ridicule and scornful things at him. According to Luke chapter 23, verse 38, when you see here in Matthew and you look in verse 37, and it said above his head, as accusation written, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. According to Luke 23, 38, it was written in Greek, Latin, and Hebrew, so all who passed by could read it and mock him. Little did they know the inscription was correct. Then in verse 45, we see the resting of sin upon him and as you look at this mark 15 says he hung on the cross from 9 a.m to 3 p.m meaning he hung there for six hours and the last three hours the sky turns black and jesus screams out he yells out my god my god why hast thou forsaken me and so you see his remarks from the cross his remarks from the cross. My God, my God, in verse 46 of Matthew 27. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Listen, rejected a man, betrayed by Judas, accursed of God, dying alone so that we who were dead in sin might live. The Bible says that Jesus yielded up the ghost and he took his last breath. And then lastly, you see the burial of the body, and we're not going to look at that. But you see the burial of the body, they would later come, they would beg the body of Jesus, and, and they would take that body down and they would lay it in the borrowed tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. There are two things about that, just real quick. And I want you to just picture this. When he took his last breath, the shouting stopped, the celebration halted, and the crowd dispersed. Why is that? First of all, for the false accusers that day, the object of their anger was dead. The object of their anger was dead. They got what they wanted. And when he had died, there was nothing else left to do other than turn and walk away. But not only for the false accusers, the object of their anger was dead, but what about his followers? For his followers, the object of their affection was dead. Later on, Peter would say, if this is all there is, and Jesus is dead, I may as well go fishing. And the disciples who were with Peter said, you know what? We go with you. Listen, if the story ended there, we all may as well go and do something else. Because a dead Savior can save no one. Finally, that terrible day ended and the lifeless body of the Lord Jesus Christ hung on that cross. And as they begged that body, and they took that body down, they took it and they laid it in a tomb similar to this of Joseph of Arimathea, and they would roll that stone in front of that tomb, and we know the Romans would put guards there to make sure that no one broke in to steal the body, to say that he arose from the dead. But we know that on Friday he died. And all hope was gone. But the good thing about that is, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming.
It's Friday. Jesus is praying. Peter is asleep. Judas is betraying. But Sunday is coming. It's Friday. Pilate's struggling. The council is conspiring. The crowd is vilifying. They don't even know that Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The disciples are running like sheep without a shepherd. Mary's crying. Peter is denying. But they don't know that Sundays are coming. It's Friday. The Romans beat my Jesus. They robe him in scar. They crown him with thorn. But they don't know that Sundays come. It's Friday. See Jesus walking to Calvary. His blood dripping. His body stumbling. And his spirit's burden. But you see, it's only Friday. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The world's winning. People are sinning. And evil's grinning. It's Friday. The soldiers nailed my Savior's hands to the cross. They nailed my Savior's feet to the cross. And then they raised him up next to criminals. It's Friday, but let me tell you something, Sunday's coming. It's Friday, the disciples are questioning what has happened to their king. And the Pharisees are celebrating that their scheming has been achieved. But they don't know, it's only Friday. Sunday's coming, it's Friday. He's hanging on the cross, feeling forsaken by his father, left alone and dying. Can nobody save him? Oh, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. It's Friday, the earth trembles, the sky grows dark, my king yields his spirit. It's Friday, hope is lost, death has won, sin has conquered, and Satan's just a laughing. It's Friday, Jesus is buried, a soldier stands guard, and a rock is rolled into place. But it's Friday. It is only Friday. Sunday is a coming.